So today we are delighted to have Anna Zayacheva come and uh, talk with us. But before we start, we'd like to say something about Casper Nagley because this is a lecture that is done in his honor. We are lucky to have a family member, Barbara, who is on Zoom with us today. Um, I like it that some people look to see the screen as though we were going to be able to see her, so we're, we're conceptually waving at Barbara. Um, so the Casper Nagley Memorial Lectureship celebrates Casper Nagley's profound impact on the lives and careers of his students and his colleagues during his time at the University of British Columbia. Nagley came to Canada in his teens as a refugee from Nazi Germany. He obtained his PhD at Harvard under Talcott Parsons, and he taught at the University of New Brunswick and the University of Oslo. Nagley was a co-editor with Parsons and others of Theories of Society, which is a classical collection of readings in sociological theory. In 1961, he co-edited with John Porter and others the first Canadian collection of sociological articles called Canadian Society. The accumulated royalties from that book were endowed and the earnings continue to fund the Casper Nagley lecture that we're having today. Nagley was hired as the second full-time sociologist at UBC in 1954 and 10 years later he became the Dean of Arts at UBC. As Dean, Professor Nagley was a champion of educational reform within universities, but he is most fondly remembered for his teaching and his compassion that he showed for his students. This is the reason that there is also a Casper Nagley Memorial Prize in Sociology, which is awarded to an undergraduate student every year and is supported by generous donations from his former students. So we welcome you here today to support and celebrate Casper Nagley's outstanding career and to continue his legacy with these lectures and these awards. And in this wonderful tradition, we're so pleased to have Anna Sayacheva here today to speak with us. And to welcome Anna formally, we have Rose, our graduate student, who's going to introduce her. Um, hi, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Anna Juziakova, sorry about that, the graduate chair in the Department of Sociology at Western University. Anna is a demographer who researches issues in population health, health inequalities, and social determinants of health over the adult life course. And in particular, she aims to understand how educational experience and attainment influence later life health and longevity around, among adults and elderly. To date, uh, Dr. Zakova was published nearly 100 articles, many of which can be found in Social Science and Medicine, Pain, Journal, of Health and Social Behavior, uh, American Journal of Public Health, International Journal of Epidemiology, and her scholarship has been recognized nationally and internationally. Recently, she has won the Faculty Scholar, uh, Scholar Award, University of Western Ontario Award for Outstanding Scholarly Achievement. In addition to the IPOMS Research Award, Metax Research Training Award, Dean's Excellence Award, extra. She is now the co-editor for the journal Canadian Public Policy, as well as the associate editor for Journal of uh, Gerontology, Social Sciences. And in today's talk, Dr. Shizakova is going to present basic facts as well as new, sometimes paradoxical findings about coronic pain and pain treatments, focusing on the US and Canada, and why and how chronic pain should play a central role in the social demographic study of health and healthcare policy. So now please join me in welcoming her to UBC Sociology. Wow, thanks so much. That was an amazing introduction. Made me feel very grown up. <laughs> So thank you for, for having me here. It is an honor and a huge pleasure to be talking about this work. Um, uh, and I understand that I have about 40 minutes. I have this super um, high tech thing, which actually does not go dark, unlike the phone. So this is, I'll, I'll try to keep myself on schedule. Um, so the, the, the title is a bit of a mouthful, but you can think about it as it's like sort of a primer about chronic pain for those of us who study population health and haven't thought about chronic pain in that way. Um, so let's start here. If I can get this to move, eventually it will. Okay. Um, the talk will, of course, be sort of our academic 
standard sort of nosebleed view of, of, of uh, facts and relationships. So I want to start here. These are just some of the adjectives um, used in one of uh, the widely used pain measures. Uh, this is the uh, McGill Pain Questionnaire by Ron Malzak. Um, and the reason we are starting here is that we have to remember with everything we do that there are people who are experiencing this daily, their loved ones are experiencing this. Uh, in fact, we, many of us, have experienced it, are experiencing it, or I'm sorry to say, especially to this younger part of the world, uh, that a room uh, will unfortunately experience. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, walk you through a couple of uh, sort of highlights of, of this research. Um, I will talk about the pain as being sort of a really major condition with likely increasing prevalence, which integrates both physical and mental dimensions of health. Then I'll spend most time on how it's shaped by social contexts such as race, education, etc. And for this room, we will see disparities that we that will not surprise us, although they do tend to surprise people outside academia who view pain as a very, very private, personal thing. Uh, but for everything I'll show you, there will be nuances and surprises. I will not talk about the fact that uh, for those of you who are interested in contested illnesses in medical sociology, pain is the emblematic condition. It's the invisible condition. Um, so I will, because we only have so much time, I will dispatch that with just one slide, but that's just something to, to keep in mind. And finally, I will again very briefly touch on the very obvious, but a lot more complicated than we are aware of, links to the opioid crisis, which of course is a, a, a very big deal, uh, especially here in uh, Vancouver. Okay, so that's going to be the, the overview. So what's my aim? At the end of the talk, I hope you'll be excited about the possibility of studying chronic pain. If you are running a new survey, that you might consider adding chronic pain uh, as a population health measure. So. The burden of uh, chronic pain is very high. The, so chronic pain is estimated to affect more people than our big three, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer combined. Now, uh, it also um, is the leading cause of disability. And why do we go to see a medical professional? Why do we go to see a doctor? Because something hurts. It's the number one reason. Right? for seeking medical care, leading cause of disability. It will not surprise you then that the cost of chronic pain is high. We don't know how high because we have one estimate from over a decade ago from the US and it does not include all the costs, but this is the number. There's no typo, it's $600 billion annually. So you can just go up from that. This is for the US, so let's rescale that for Canada. And it is, as I already alluded to, linked to the opioid crisis, rising suicide uh, rates, and likely the decreasing um, or sort of uh, you know, stagnating midlife health uh, among especially US, but uh, to some degree Canadian adults as well. Now commensurate with this condition, there has been a ton written up. If you just, you know, uh, scholar Google chronic pain, you will end up with about 1.7 million. So, like, what are we doing? Isn't everything known? Well, no, because all of that, nearly all of that, is biomedical, clinical, experimental, psychological. People like us, we haven't studied chronic pain. And so, a lot of what I'll be doing is just laying very, very basic groundwork, descriptive studies. So my job will have no, no cool methods, no nothing. It's just going to be all basic graphs and descriptives, okay, because we haven't done. So what have we done? Not much. 
If you look since 2000 for just pain in the title, not just crying, but pain in the title, there were all the four in SSMTH, four in JHSB, and demography wins the prize for two out of them. Sounds. If you look at chronic pain, that's even less. Now, there are uh, several reasons why we haven't done this, um, but I will just do one more slide just to, for those of you who are demographers uh, and think a lot about the disablement process, basically a process uh, from a disease process, impairment, disability, and potentially death for, for terminal conditions, if you take a, a quintessential condition like arthritis, of course that's not terminal, but we have an, uh, a disease process, uh, um, uh, arthritis, impairment, uh, inflamed joints, um, limitations, difficulty walking, standing, etc., disability, the need to relinquish social roles, so why do people have trouble walking quarter mile with arthritis? Because it hurts. Pain is an integral part of the entire process. Okay, so, uh, but, um, oh, moreover, um, pain has been theorized, it will not surprise you, since antiquity. In all ancient civilizations that uh, we have writings from, pain has been studied and, and thought about and typically viewed as a uh, um, sort of result of some supernatural forces. Um, interestingly, but again, not surprisingly, pain has been central to many religions, if not most, certainly Christianity among those, right? The, um, the, the notion of suffering uh, and, and withstanding suffering with grace has been central to whether Catholic, uh, Catholicism or uh, any of the Protestant religions. Now, the breakthrough, a turning point, came in the 17th century, specifically in 1664, where René Descartes um, uh, start, for the first time actually write a, tr a treated pain um, uh, in a scientific way, and he thought of pain as a as a mechanistic sensation. Uh, any anybody we have uh, anybody who ha who has a, a medical degree, this is a picture that I've encountered more than once. This is a, a classic. But the point is that in this mechanistic sensation, something injures the body, and uh, the sensation is uh, brought to the brain where it is perceived which sounds like, well, duh, no? Well, no, but for 300 years, this notion of this sort of uh, brain as a passive um, receptor of, of pain has been, um, and, and in fact, I think it, pertain, it persists to this day. Now, nearly, exactly 300 years later, we have another turning point, and that's uh, Mel Zabinwall and Ed McGill uh, published the gate control theory. The idea of the gate control theory uh, is uh, that pain is painful stimulus is being transmitted to the spine, at which point you can think there are gates uh, where they can open and let the pain um, stimulus through or not. And we all practice gate control theory if you, um, you know, um, like injure your, your finger, and what do we do? We do this, right? We do this automatically. Why do we do this? Because the sensation from the rubbing uh, is competing with the pain sensation, and it decreases the, or, or completely shuts off the pain signal going up to the brain. But there's, wait, there's more. The other thing um, about gate control theory is that it also, uh, theorize not just these ascending pathways, but also descending pathways, meaning the brain doesn't just receive the pain signals, the brain plays an active role in generating the pain sensation. Um, sometimes I'll just, okay. And since then, um, I guess I can't walk around because this doesn't seem to, uh, okay. 
And this really has formed uh, the current uh, theoretical foundations, which just emphasize a greater and greater role of brain in the pain sensations, uh, where um, now this is the neuromatrix theory, where the idea is that there are the matrix, that there's a matrix of brain centers which jointly produce or uh, modulate the pain sensation. The other uh, theoretical foundation is the biopsychosocial theory, which again, the biomedical world is acknowledging the social roots. Now, this is probably hard to see. However, their social roots really, and the research, uh, sort of stop with social networks and social support. So it's not really sort of the, the social ecological model which we use in our work where we can focus on uh, the social context in which we'll live. Okay, so this is, this is sort of the lay of the land within the literature outside uh, of our field. All right, now I have a quiz. <laughs> It should be easy, right? Like I was saying, pain, pain, pain. You were like nodding. And everybody knows. Okay, students, you used to business. No. Okay. Well, it's not surprising because the definition of pain is very, very difficult. This is an updated one from 2020. Pain is the unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. What? So, <laughs> the definition is problematic because pain is so complex. Again, remember this is not the mechanistic Descartian or Cartesian understanding because pain can be real in the absence of an evident uh, injury in the body. And this is what the definition uh, really brings home. And if you really hate this definition, then the pioneering pain scholar Marco Caffrey uh, basically said, pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is. Okay. Now, pain. Now, what is chronic pain? Let's see. So, um, Standard operation is just pain that lasts a long time. That's sort of kind of true, but that's a small part of it. The important fact is that chronic and acute pain are fundamentally different phenomena. Acute pain is an adaptive and necessary response without which, if people lack this, uh, uh, lack the ability to feel pain, they die very young. It's a very tough life. And you can think of it as a fire alarm that functions to alert you to a disease or injury. In contrast, chronic pain is a maladaptive pathological dysfunction of the fire alarm. So you can think in your house, the fire alarm blaring and blaring, and it's just as alarming, but there's just no fire, okay? So basically it's a malfunction of the nervous system or the pain system. In fact, the acute pain and common pain have different signatures in the human brain using fMRIs. Very importantly, fairly recently, chronic pain has been recognized as a disease, not just a symptom of. That's one of the reasons why chronic pain has maybe not been studied as much in our field, because it was viewed as a symptom of a, of a condition. And certainly acute pain is, but not chronic pain. Uh, the ICD-11 recently recognized pain as, for the very first time, as a condition, so now we have uh, an elaborate classification of chronic pain uh, as a condition, and this is absolutely critical for research and for funding. Like the NIH in the US does not have an institute of pain. So pain can squeak in with people's research applications here and there, but there's no budget line for that institute. So it just always has to compete against other conditions. The other reason why maybe our fields have been somewhat reluctant to study pain is its subjective nature. 
So just to illustrate, there's a famous quote, to have great pain <coughs> is to have certainty. To hear that another person has pain is to have doubt. In other words, it's very hard to convey uh, pain to others. Okay? Um, so, given this difficulty, how do we measure pain? <laughs> so, it is always self-reported. Not for lack of trying. There's been a lot of effort trying to uh, get at, at measuring pain objectively. But that has not been successful to date. So we measure pain using various ways, such as the pain scale, which you've experienced if you've been to a hospital one way or another. Uh, there has been efforts to try to find pain signatures in the brain. And like I said, there are those, but they're not correlated enough with people's reports of pain, the subjective nature. And there's also been a lot of research trying to understand facial expressions in humans and non-human, uh, non so animals. Uh, this looks a little funny maybe, but the important thing is to understand pain among uh, non-verbal people, whether babies, elderly, etc. Okay, so there's been a lot of work. Um, this is something that should make us happy. You know, when we present anywhere, people ask, do you have the gold standard measurement of heart disease? What about disability? Well, here, we have competitive advantage. Because we ask the same way that everybody else asks. So if anything, we should be all over measuring and studying chronic pain. Okay, so, but then, uh, so how prevalent is chronic pain? That's a basic question, right? Yeah, not so simple to answer. Depends on how you ask. One of the difficulties is that in part because we haven't talked about uh, uh, chronic pain in population health world, people have put all kinds of questions. So the CCHS uh, asks, are you usually free of pain or discomfort? The LISA, uh, which by the way, anybody works with LISA, it is, uh, I think, the best Canadian data source for studying pain. Uh, Talk to me, please, if that's what okay. Uh, NHIS, that's in uh, CCHS's uh, US equivalent. How often did you have pain? Are you often troubled with pain? Do you have, uh, so you, you see the point, right? And so it will not surprise you that based on how you ask people, you will get different um, prevalence results. But we are able to take the most frequent definition and the one number that I would share with you to take home is that it is estimated that one out of five, both Americans and Canadians, or more, have chronic pain at any given moment. Um, that translates to 50 million adults in the US and 7 million Canadians. So these are truly very, very high numbers. Now, not only are they high, but it looks like the prevalence of pain may be increasing over time. So this is, uh, this is actually not from a paper. We started, this is actually where we started, um, now it feels like many years ago, um, um, you know, understanding trends in chronic pain. This is from an unpublished paper, but this is from CCHS. So I just wanted to show a result for Canada. Basically, whether you look at US, Canada, or Europe, uh, we don't quite have data from other parts of the world. Whether you look at uh, you know, older adults, younger adults, male, females, different levels of SES, we're seeing increases in pain prevalence. Well, we don't know. Um, but I, I, I have more for you. So we do know certain things that are associated, correlated with those increases. Those, um, obesity is certainly uh, an important driving factor. Psychological distress and excessive alcohol use are probably complicated bi-directional and confounded relationships. So we need to do a lot more. I'm just putting these out there because I know that those are very closely correlated with those increases. The increased use of opioids may play a part, as I will see, I'll show you at the end of the talk. And how many of you are thinking, well, could it be just reporting? Okay. Again, the short answer is we don't know yet. But 
the longer answer is we have done two separate analysis of two different data sets and very different approaches to try to get at reporting. Happy to discuss the details. What I can show you that both of those analyses found no evidence for reporting. Now, of course, that does not mean we found evidence of lack of reporting, but that's where we are. Um, so we don't know this. There's, you know, all of these don't knows, graduate students, all of those don't knows are awesome topics or, you know, for, for, for work, for um, research. Now, I promise that everything that we look at gets complicated quickly. So here, again, we need some nuance. Over the past five years, I kept seeing sort of these signals that maybe it's not been, isn't always increasing uniformly. So when I looked at just high intensity or severe pain, there certainly wasn't an evidence of increase. And when I just look at people who have chronic pain, of those who have chronic pain, what proportion have severe pain that is even steeper to climb? So maybe severe pain is flatter declining over time. You know, I haven't actually shared this even with more than just one member of my, of my team. So this is like I just ran some of these numbers uh, and created uh, the figures um, yesterday. So lots more to discuss what's happening with pain intensity. Okay. Now, the uh, results that I'll show you next really draw on something or point something about what we think of as a holistic measure of chronic pain, which means that sometimes pain acts like other physical conditions, and sometimes it acts, behaves, shows patterns similar to mental health conditions like depression and anxiety. And it is associated with both and I think that's one of the reasons why we think pain is such a good measure, sensitive measure of, of, uh, of population health because it taps into, into both aspects, sort of like celebrated health, except it has direct policy implications, okay, both clinical and otherwise. All right, so I uh, laid this down to, to uh, prepare us for thinking about some of the key um, patterns that we see in chronic pain in the populations. I will show you a couple results for individual level characteristics such as age patterns, gender, race, ethnicity, and education, so specifically education. And then I will also move beyond the individual towards geographic uh, disparities. And those are really important because they might hint at context beyond you know, individual characteristics and would hint at something uh, that is broader in the way we we'll live, the way that our policies are, uh, that may influence our, um, uh, you know, our, our risk for developing pain. Okay, so uh, here, this is what we see with age. The unsurprising part, I think, will be the pain increases with age. The part that's less obvious is that what we see here is deceleration, plateauing, and in fact, oftentimes just plunging of pain. And so the question is, why is it? Is it, is it, there's, there's a lot of literature about lower pain sensitivity among older adults. Here, you know, we wonder APC issues. Again, open question. Uh, very likely that cohort differences are playing a part. Um, in these patterns. So we're not entirely certain. Okay. Gender. Oops. Okay. Gender. For gender, I actually snuck in a result for you there. Do you remember this plot? Yeah. That's where what we see is women had higher pain than men. Now, if there is one finding that has been 
that basically shown over and over and over again, although it keeps being studied over and over again, is that women have more pain, more severe pain, more, more uh, frequent pain, etc., compared with men. Although when you say this in a lay audience, they're surprised because, you know, they'll say, well, you know, if men had to give birth, the humanity would have died a long time ago, right? So this idea of, of women sort of at least withstanding pain better. But so women have uh, uniformly higher pain than men. Yes. So just clarification, severe pain is a form of chronic pain, so it's over a long term as well? Yes, all of these are, are, are almost everything I'm showing you is chronic pain, yes. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, and yes, if you have other clarifying questions, please uh, please ask as well, it really helps. I, uh, I'm flying through so many studies, it, it may be important to clarify. Now, uh, I'll show you race and ethnicity. So let's jump into uh, findings for what we see uh, for race and ethnic disparities in chronic pain. This is for US data, but we actually started playing with Canadian data, and we are seeing something that's not drastically different. So some of the patterns are the same. So I will just summarize these with just a single figure. Um, what we have here is, um, Native American, multiracial, non-Hispanic, white, non-Hispanic, and Hispanic, and Asian. The terminology and categories are commensurate with the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, so this, these are U.S. categories. And uh, we have a percent with, this is high impact chronic pain. In this particular study, we actually had six different uh, measures of pain. They all acted reasonably similarly. Um, just looking at some basic controls, let's compare the, uh, the, the that trio that gets studied the most. In fact, we named, we titled the paper Beyond Black versus White because the everything that's been published is on black-white comparison. So, how do these cat the, these uh, three categories compare with respect to pain? They're sort of neck and neck. Across all these six actors, sometimes whites are a little higher than both, the Hispanics tend to be lower than, than the other two. But this trio has been studied to death, yet they're sort of similar, especially in contrast to non Hispanic Asian Americans, which have way lower pain. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have Native American and multiracial American, Americans or American adults. That have, I mean, these differences are the only order of three or four times the prevalence. These are not small differences. I could spend hours on this slide because we, we actually were able to disaggregate some of the, uh, the categories, but this is what we see. What is also interesting that when we control for a couple of basic uh, socioeconomic characteristics, the category that stands out the most are multiracial. Americans. So for Native Americans, that pain excess appears to be very heavily driven by their low SCS. But for multiracial Americans, there's something else going on. And what we think it may have to do with psychosocial characteristics, such as issues of, of discrim double discrimination, belonging, identity, uh, borrowing from, from LGBT literature, minority stress. So uh, something to, to, to start studying. But nonetheless, so we're seeing uh, disparities, but also sort of unexpected patterns here. Um, what about education? Again, I will summarize with a simple slide. Um, we have people with less than high school, high school degree, some college, and meaning some university or college, for in the US the language is the same, academic or vocational associate degrees of sub-baccalaureate credential, BA and MA plus. Now, it may not surprise anybody in this room that we see steep differences uh, and disparities in, as expected, people with less education, more pain, more education, less pain, right? We're good. Uh, again, just so that you can sort of orient yourself around how we did this, this is just a couple of basic um, covariates. Um, but that group in between, you know, we should expect there to have sort of somewhere in between in terms of, but that's not what we see. They have as much pain as high school dropouts, at least the ones without the AA degree. Why is it? I can tell you what it's not. All these characteristics 
When we control for those, now notice what will happen with the gray bars. It balances them out. It fully explains. The combination of all these characteristics fully explains the gradient, but it does not explain what's happening to these folks. Okay. So, some of you may be saying, well, couldn't it be that they dropped out because they had pain? Or that, so, I will, so that, that, and that's a very good question. Let's see a couple of ways that I can think about answering that. These are people who are on average 40. So we are looking at 20 years past their dropout. Not for everybody, of course, people go back to school. But by and large, it's 20 years later. So it's not very likely that this is something that a disease process that stayed stable for that long. Then there is the small factor of the 150 years worth of literature in sociology, in educational studies, institutional research, psychology, on reasons for student dropout or attrition. And in those 150 years, health does not feature. Now again, the, the uh, absence of that evidence does not mean evidence of absence. And it is quite likely that some people may have dropped out because they had disease process that then is, you know, when they're 40, they're caught by NHIS and report pain. But it's very likely that that's not why people drop out. Okay? That's not why like, these groups as averages dropped out. So what could it be? It is probably a combination of sort of the life paths that uh, this level of education put them on and quite likely also selection, so uh, um, confounding by their own um, characteristics, whether cognitive, non-cognitive, um, that, uh, that are then linked to higher pain. But again, another thing that we need to understand better. And for those of you who are surprised by this, by the way, this, this same pattern as strongly is evident in Canada, and it is evident for many other health this is something that I'm happy to talk about uh, a lot. Okay, um, so in addition to these individual level factors, which highlight the social context of pain, I want to step outside. And I want to look at disparities across regions. So for this study, what we did was um, actually you know, it was at the beginning of COVID, and a bunch of us at Western came together and uh, developed this survey. You know, the, it's a, it's a four thousand something odd people. It's modest, but it's it's the, it, it was really exciting to to have those data. So in twenty twenty, we uh, did a survey, online survey of all, um, Canadians and Americans, and one of the questions that we were able to pose had to do with their pain. So what did we find? What we found was these are just this is um, control. This is just gross patterns. So what we are seeing is um, some uh, variation across Canada, but clearly the answer actually used to be no. I didn't have that, but now we do. Um, so let me just uh, scroll back because I think we're doing on time. Um, so in, in the research I did for this paper, we just had employment status, we had occupational prestige, which doesn't get in the OSHA specific things that you're talking about. Um, but uh, Xavier Saint-Denis and his students, Katya Dragon and Emmanuel, um, like I lost him, um, and I are, um, have taken the information about occupation and he uh, linked it to own, through ONET to occupational characteristics, which he was able to classify. So what we know is that occupational specific, so it is not just occupation label, it's the characteristics associated with that occupation. Physical characteristics, uh, such as, you know, whether there is, uh, you know, a need to uh, repetitive motion and that kind of sort of physical strain on the body is related to pain but does not explain this at all. So it's not that. That paper hopefully will come together. I think uh, Xavier presented it at ASA last year, so it should be, it should be out um, yeah, at some point. 
Okay, so my internet's uh, back to working now, so apologies to everyone in the Zoom chat. Uh, we dropped on the geographic slide, so yep. if you want I'm back there, okay. and thanks for asking questions in the meantime. So with the geographic pain disparity, so when we look at the countries as, as units, Canada has lower pain, significant lower pain than the US, but that difference was explained if we controlled for one particular variable. That was a very strong signal. Economic hardship. Mm -hmm. Not income, not, not education, but economic hardship. And we've been seeing since that if we have access to economic hardship or food insecurity, that overrides all other SCS measures. It's a very powerful signal for pain. And I think it's because of the linkage between that as being the stressor, showing that precarity, that vulnerability, much more so than just household income. And again, tapping into those mental aspects of pain. So that's, that's one finding. And the other are these obvious hotspots in the US, in the Deep South and somewhat in the West. And those were not explained by any of the individual factors, not even financial hardship. What that suggests is that there's something going on in these areas, politics-wise, policy-wise, etc., that is putting people at risk for pain. And um, I've been doing this work with uh, Jennifer Ferris Montes for, for quite a few years. These areas light up red no matter what health outcome you look at. So this, this fits what we know about the deep south. Yes? Is this, this is a different measure than, because you told us earlier it was one in five in both Canada and the US, but this is- This is a different measure. It's a, it's a little clunky measure. It's a, it's a measure that is a product of pain frequency and pain intensity oh. on a continuous scale. And this is actually because it controls, this is standardized. And so the, it's the residuals that are interpolated here, especially through yeah. mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. the, Sorry, that was, uh, Lindsay had a question and- Yeah, go Lindsay first, mm -hmm. okay. What's going on in Louisiana? <laughs> well, I have a very good question. question. Yes. Um, the short answer is we don't know. The longer answer is, and we are very, very careful in the paper, is that, um, you know, if you remember, we had 4,200 cases altogether. We only had 21 cases in Louisiana, which was the absolute minimum that we even allowed for analysis of the state. So I do, and we are interpret this with caution. So maybe something is going on that protects people. I would worry that it's a data artifact. So we don't know. Uh, the other things we trust more because they are much more robust and based on a larger number of, of cases. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah. Uh, was there? That was, that was oh, my okay. question, yeah. so we're good. <laughs> Um, we do need, so the data are sort of available uh, with NHIS, but it's, they're locked in, in RDCs and so to do, uh, you know, you, you all know that RDCs locally are enough of a pain, uh, to do that in the U.S. is no better. So, uh, so we've seen, uh, the patterns across Spain, which, uh, are clearly, um, sort of socially uh, uh, affected or sort of uh, dis, um, show large disparities, but also sort of these patterns that we're not necessarily used to with other outcomes. So to slowly start uh, uh, going towards our conclusion is like I said, I'm not going to discuss a pain as a contested condition concept. But again, we have a, a really powerful quote here from Elaine Scarry, The Body of Pain, if you want to read, it's a, um, a, a powerful book. Whatever pain achieves, it achieves through its unshareability. And it ensures the unshareability through its persistence to language. That is conveying your pain to others is very difficult. As anybody, especially females, especially visible minority people who try to convince others, typically a physician, of their pain. So to study pain as a contested condition, there is a lot to be gained. Pain is, as I showed you, a uh, pain is the emblematic uh, um, 
contested condition because it is invisible, because it has only recently been recognized. Um, and medical practice, as you know, is very slow picking up research and uh, guideline changes because it is heavily gendered, because it is very, uh, uh, um, because it has uh, social disparities, etc. So there is a lot. And insofar as sociologists contributed to study of pain, this was area, this is an area where it, there, there are interesting studies. So um, I'm happy to talk about it. Okay, but we are almost out of time and I didn't get to that last topic, which has to do with opioids. So, couple of, again, just sort of something that I think we really can't leave this room without at least seeing. So, pain is frequently under-treated, full stop. Meaning many, if not most patients, do not get sufficient pain relief, uh, do not get pain relief based on current guidelines or based on what research shows is effective. Yet at the same time, patients and related to that, they are often over medicated. And in fact, opioids are now the most widely prescribed class of medications, both in Canada and in the US. Uh, US has uh, the highest per capita opioid use in the world, and Canada proudly second. Now, that would still be fine, except there is no research that shows the efficacy of opioids in long-term use. In, so what we, what we know is statements like the majority of you know, uh, chronic pain opioid patients do not benefit from opioids. Or the evidence, the quality of evidence for every outcome in pain of opioid efficacy was very low. Well. Basically, nobody's looked into this. People are, millions of people are prescribed long-term opioids. And yet, uh, there is no research to speak of to document the efficacy. Now, I want to be very clear. There are many people who need opioids, who benefit from opioids, even very high doses of opioids and for extended periods of time. There are such people, there are such conditions. This is not anti-opioid, but they are being prescribed indiscriminately without evidence. In fact, actually there is evidence, but only for its harms. That literature is great. We know that long-term opioids have severe gastrointestinal, immune suppressing function, pro-inflammatory function. It looks to have a detrimental epigenetic effects and may even be implicated in cancer development. One thing that you might be wondering what's missing here, and I'm going to add it now, but in tiny font, and that's the issue of addiction. And I'm looking at Lindsay here because I, I, I hope, uh, um, because percentage wise, addiction and, um, or, or opioid use disorder, those are synonyms, or misuse, that's a very iffy term. Among people who are on long-term opioids, is actually very low. But the problem is, when you prescribe it to so many people, even this ends up being a lot, folks. And moreover, if you flood the country with opioids, then they get diverted for misuse. Or um, so, so that is really important to keep that in mind. Again, that nuance. Okay, and <laughs> and there's there's more, right? Uh, Moreover, for some conditions, taking opioids actually exacerbates them. Certainly, their pain symptoms or pain, sorry, pain, uh, pain syndromes uh, such as fibromyalgia, um, where uh, migraines, headaches, where opioids can be uh, uh, contraindicated. But even when used um, for appropriate conditions or types of pain, uh, there is a, a opioid-induced hyperalgesia, so opioid use pain sensitization, which actually exacerbates pain. Okay, so this is really, um, I think, surprising to, even to me when I was reading this literature, you know, uh, over the course of the years, that there is really so little uh, research. 
But let's end on a positive note. There are exciting uh, developments in chronic pain treatment. Um, among those, I will just mention, you are seeing, what you think you are seeing, uh, in just last year, a couple of months ago, the International Association for the Study of Pain has actually produced and put on a webinar on uh, the pharmacology, history, neuroscience, and clinical efficacy of psychedelics as potentially uh, a useful tool to combat pain. So there is, there's, a, there's a lot happening um, to replace the growing understanding of the difficulty of work. Okay, so to wrap up, what we went through was showing you uh, pain as a costly, um, a burdensome condition uh, with increasing prevalence, but maybe, maybe, maybe seeing lower prevalence at the high intensity levels, which integrates physical and mental dimensions. I didn't show you a lot of that. You just have to take my words for it, but I do have some, some, some slides on showing sort of correlations among different um, conditions uh, and pain. Then we spend most time on looking at how pain is shaped by social context, such as education, race, ethnic, and geographic disparities. Uh, again, we dispatch this fascinating uh, uh, issue with just one slide, but just something to remember for those of you who are interested. And then finally, we cannot neglect that link to the opioid crisis. So this is where I'll stop. I will thank uh, uh, my, you know, our core team, our team actually, it includes Kimberly Heuser, who is um, uh, on a team uh, with um, a paper that my former student, uh, Anthony Jen, is going to finish, for sure. <laughs> um, and we are hiring uh, for, on a, for our postdoc position. There's a couple of papers that we uh, based the paper on. I have a couple of slides if you're interested. And, and I lost my concluding slide. So we can just probably do without it. So <laughs> let's stop here. And so thank you. I look forward to your talks. Okay, so there's Catherine and Guy. So first, uh, I, thank you very much for your talk. You really sold selling of chronic pain. I secretly feel like I want to switch over, which is going to be a real switch for me. <laughs> um, so I was going to go back to the Canada U.S. slide. Sure. I thought that was so interesting. Um, and when I saw that slide, one, Canada, we're doing so well. But secondly, uh, it makes me think healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So obviously, like even in the universal healthcare system, we still know there's inequality in people's access to healthcare. But certainly, it's better than this hybrid system they have working in the United States. So could you tell me a little bit about you know you did say the stressors and the precarity and the vulnerability, which is yeah, absolutely makes perfect sense. But what's the interaction between the healthcare system and the sort of places where there's more income inequality and therefore the access to healthcare might, like maybe that accounts for some of the, the red hot zone and stuff. So, excellent question, really important one. The, again, the two second answers I don't know, but the better, the better answer is as follows. Uh, we do know that uh, access to healthcare in terms of type of health insurance for the US matters. But it matters in complicated ways. For instance, people who don't have health insurance are much less likely than those with health insurance to get opioids. Well, duh, except those opioids may be doing more harm than good on average. Then having access to not just insurance, but really top-notch insurance is critical because we do know for, for I mean, there are different types of pain, etc. But but if you sort of take chronic pain uh, as, a, as a category, we do know there are certain things that help. There is in fact one treatment that helps nearly uniformly, has no side effects, is really powerful, documented very well. Exercise. Exercise. <laughs> Meditation actually has been studied. The, the, 
research shows no efficacy. But clinicians find it helps a lot of patients. So to some degree, uh, it is quite likely that there is a lot of heterogeneity. A lot of, so, uh, so not to dismiss, but exercise is really well studied. But clinicians don't have time to explain and motivate and check on patients. And you know, not every patient is as motivated as I'm sure everybody in this room is, right? So the point, the, sorry, that's a long way of saying the access to good health care is critical. But even here with universal health care, or even in the US, having good health care does not in any way guarantee access to adequate pain treatment. And I think that's that's a major problem. This guy, and then there's somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, this is really interesting. Um, I'm wondering uh, the way you presented the data, I may have missed this, but in any, are there any data sources yet that are allow a panel perspective to get at sort of individual level? How are people changing over time? And then I'm sort of connecting that to more questions. Are there family effects? Are there twin twin studies yet on this? Or is, just, or is there just not enough data to get at any of this? How, how much of this is potentially shared with you? <laughs> that is the data set. That is the data set that would allow us to answer all those a lot of those questions. So uh, a little bit more. So uh, for those of you who don't know the longitudinal and international study of adults, which despite the international title is a Canadian data set, don't ask me, uh, is a, a very unusual data set because it is family based. And uh, as opposed to individual based, like most of our data, and it actually has good, so for a survey like this, very good pain measures. So it would actually get, and, and I actually got funded to do that, but then it turned out I don't really want to spend my whatever remains of my youth in RDC, <clears throat> so it, it's not happening at the time. <laughs> um, the, uh, other than that, it's really really uh, difficult but yes absolutely the the, the changes over time uh, that is doable with uh, easy data like the HRS um, and uh, we just haven't gotten around we have done there's the, we've, we've actually published some studies on uh, transitions uh, um, across pain disability and mortality but that that doesn't really get into that juicy stuff of how long do people have pain you know, pain is really really complex for those you know some sometimes pain sort of flat sometimes it's recurrent sometimes it's intermittent it can come and go it, it is really uh, very difficult um, to capture it in a survey uh, but with hrs at least we could do a little bit of that we just haven't gotten around to it and i'm not aware of uh, of uh, research that has done that yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there was a question there. Yeah, so we've got two on the Zoom chat. Uh, Hadel, if you want to unmute and ask your question, uh, go ahead or ask me to go first. Uh, let me just make sure I'm unmuted here. Okay, good. Sorry, I'm just couldn't find my button. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Um, can you hear me? Um, yeah, basically, let me yes, just see if bit. I can fix that on my end. Uh, okay. Start talking again. Can you hear me now? Okay, Is that better? Sorry. Uh, let me switch. Okay, there we go. Okay, we'll just try again. And if you just want to repeat the question once sure. you get to the room, that way we'll make sure we can hear it. Okay, uh, I changed it from my end as well. Oh, yeah, that's me. Um, the big. And I was wondering what kind, of policies, um, what kind of policy changes could we kind of try to implement or discuss to. Um, affect chronic pain because even amongst Canada there are it's it seems that photo was quite universal that it was all kind of bluish um but I guess how can our jobs affect kind of large-scale positive impacts it's, it's not universal but it's a bit more equitable um yeah, when yeah. the map kind of shows that so I don't know I guess I'm asking that's, uh, that's a great question. So the question was, what kind of policy changes maybe, yeah. could be implemented? If I'm uh, 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 interpreting uh, your question correctly, um, so policy changes are being implemented. So there are very clear, forceful guidance uh, uh, guidelines 
um, both in Canada and in the US um, against the use of opioid, long-term opioid therapy, against the, uh, and for uh, promoting exercise, promoting uh, kind of so meditation, so mind-body therapies, um, uh, taking alternative medications, etc. We also know that there was, uh, in addition to exercise, what helped patients were interdisciplinary pain clinics, which existed here in Canada. And they existed actually in decent numbers in the US. But with the changes in uh, the reimbursement scenarios, they died. They're expensive. So everybody, it's just much cheaper to prescribe uh, oxy to a patient that takes about three seconds flat as opposed to counsel and uh, have an interdisciplinary team of uh, psychologists, therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists uh, to work with a patient. So, so the policies are in place. So maybe uh, to answer your question further uh, would be to up the uh, information campaign towards physicians and to change the reimbursement so that physicians aren't pressed for time uh, and are able to actually uh, uh, treat patients appropriately. One other thing that needs to change is physicians are not educated about pain. Medical schools offer still, even this day and age, somewhere between, maybe by now it's not zero, but a handful of hours of a lecture on chronic pain. So physicians are not taught how to treat pain, if they have a patient on opiates, how to taper safely. Uh, so changing education in medical schools and, and investing in, in sort of uh, interdisciplinary pain clinics would be you know, my easy way of saying, you know, fixing the problem. Um, uh, Rina. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could tell us about the literature on um, what the what it looks like more globally, the patterns. Um, we actually have two papers um, uh, that Zach Zimmer has led uh, on um, pain disparities around the world. There are huge disparities uh, across world countries. But it's not entirely, you know, when you look at, and I, I don't have a slide, sorry, I, I should have, um, wish Zach were here, but um, it's not entirely, it's, there isn't like low income countries have high pain or low pain or what have you, uh, or, or middle income countries have this or that. It's sort of all over the map. Uh, the one country that does stand out is China, which has fairly consistently the lowest pain of, uh, prevalence. Um, prevalences um, of all the world countries. The problem that we're encountering, of course, that many countries use different languages and we don't really know how to equalize uh, the, the different ways that, you know, even just, you know, absent any cultural tendencies uh, or underlying prevalence of pain, how even just language uh, matters. So, so there are large disparities. They're not in particular, I would say maybe we do see some uh, Asian countries, but not all, uh, not India, for instance, is, uh, has fairly high pain. And coincidentally or not, uh, um, Indian Canadians, so uh, Canadian immigrants from, from South Asia uh, tend to have fairly high pain here in Canada. We don't know in the US because they're too small of a group to, to measure. So uh, lots more needs to be done there. The data are probably the leading uh, barrier. So what are the high pain countries? Like China's low, what would be a good example? I don't know off the top of my head, but I can look it up. Okay. Generally, generally <laughs> it's um there are so some smaller countries I remember just popped up with very high pain prevalences, but we're we are not sure like with Louisiana what's what's going on. So even when the sample size is not 21 cases, but you know, 2000, we're not entirely certain because we don't, you know, we don't know how the surveillance is administered, et cetera. Like, I think it's in Mauritania or Madagascar, one of those places that that, uh, uh, that had very, very high pain. Um, from what I remember, I think North countries of uh, North Africa and then high income countries. 
Um, and there, you know, it could be our sedentary lifestyle, or it could be uh, that the expectations about pain have changed for us, right? We think there's meds, and so if we feel pain, we maybe we shouldn't. So, so who knows, right? So yes, there are some studies, or um, at least two, that that are out there. Uh, uh, so, yeah, then yeah, Laura also so yeah, so I have two very different questions on the brain silver band. One is I uh, remember you exactly. talked about like the unshareability of pain, like this concrete to me and doubtful for others, but I'm really, really interested in the social network effect and like geographic gap, but that's also social comfort. So right? people talking to each other, people encouraging each other to exercise or not. And he who shall not be named taking over university, the medical sociologist, <laughs> focuses his career on thinking about like the, the network effects of health and behavior mm -hmm. and ad health in the US. And so I'm just really curious what is the state of the research in this own area about social networks, kind of um, how, how that affects like reporting pain, experiencing pain, and addressing pain. And the other kind of big question that I'm interested in to answer about is on the gender difference, and that we have decades and centuries of research on men and have excluded women from medical research for decades and centuries, specifically around pain, but around everything. And that includes occupational hazards, right? We focus on coal mines and industry, but not nursing and like nail polish, right? We just don't know very much about women. And you can strip anything to trios, this is probably the example of the police. So like this can we get caught up in our scientific knowledge of the presence of pain in women? It's going to take us decades or centuries because we are just so far ahead with our understanding of men's bodies and not women's bodies. So that that so both are great questions. So for the for the gender slash sex difference, sex difference is the one thing that people in the biomedical field uh, uh, focus on because it's easy to take female mice and male mice. So we do actually know, and there is, and it's it's relatively easy to bring uh, women into the lab and stuff. So so there women have been studied for for pain experimental pain fairly heavily. Um, uh, in terms of pain thresholds, pain tolerances, etc. Um, but it does not necessarily mean that what we know about, you know, uh, pain perception between the two sexes in any way translates what happens in a doctor's office. So unfortunately, those two things, so that the, this is what you are interested in, right? How women are treated. And that's a, a effectively different question in terms of believability, uh, issues of you know uh, judgment, issues of deservability of, of, of pain. Those are actually huge questions. And um, uh, there's a historian at Princeton named Keith Bailu who um, has studied the role of pain in the U.S. Not just like health policy, but but policy debates globally because the the issue of whose pain deserves. Uh, support in the form of disability, very, very important to debate. Well, those are all these judgment calls that, so uh, if you're interested, that's a very interesting I don't just mean the believability, which is a big part, but like we have very strict uh, guidelines around how much a man can lift, but we have very fewer guidelines around how much a woman can lift, right? like OSHA and stuff. Yeah. And just, so like all of that, including the believability, but just like understanding what a woman's body can go through. Yeah. We just don't know as much about that. I, I will say that I think that is changing because founders require that. So little by little, I, 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 I'm positive, like I'm positive, not, not like I, but I, I'm optimistic okay. that that's changing little by little. And the first question I forgot. <laughs> social networks. Oh, social networks. Nothing in the perspective sense. Uh, <laughs> The uh, 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 quite a bit we was I was I supposed to like do the Voldemort thing? Um, uh, <laughs> in terms of social support, it's that that is on the opposite end of the spectrum. There, there is no doubt, and it's very well recognized that social support is key, critical, central, and indispensable to recovering from pain or, or managing chronic pain effectively. Um, in fact, there's a, a nice new study uh, by Yu, so Yulin Yang, who's now at UCSF, has uh, looked at relationships like friendships and chronic pain and uh, sort of what, how chronic pain influences friendships and friendships influence <coughs> chronic pain. So little by little, a handful of people are trying to pick that up. 
and at health i'm very pleased to say i emailed bob hummer and i'm like uh could you do paint and he said it's already there mm -hmm. so at health will actually be available uh to study pain um uh, 2026 i think the, the list is okay uh curtis you're up next uh i will uh yes respond hopefully so that we can uh there you go. Okay. Go. Hopefully you can hear me. My name is Curtis. I'm a public health resident. Thank you very much for that talk. It's good to see some of that population level data. And I guess my question is centered around the fact that we know that this is a big problem. It's prevalent. It's rooted in the structural and social determinants of health. There are many bodies looking into like the Canadian Pain Task Force and many other people like yourself and looking actually describing this issue in more in depth. I guess my main question is, uh, and I'm also kind of getting stuck in this like descriptive trap, describing the problem over and over again. What more population level data or um, what types of research do you think is needed to actually connect to better, more centralized, better change nationally? Because we know it's a national problem, like a talk of like a pain strategy like Australia has or something that actually doesn't rely on bottom like uh, these self-organizing groups that may or may not hold up to a standard to actually um, help people in pain and also prevent pain. Wow, well, you guys are asking big questions. So let me try to let me try to summarize this for the room and you just tell me thumbs up, thumbs down, whether I'm getting it right. But the, the question is, you know, so so research is being done left and right, but but what will it take to affect change? Yeah, I, what what uh, what other descriptive or population level study do you think that we need that that uh -huh. actually that actually help make a change other than just describing the problem more? Um, I do think that long term studies on chronic opioid use or uh, long term LTOT uh, long term opioid therapy is is really important. Um, within research, uh, again, it is well understood that uh, opioids for the average chronic pain patient, not to, not to say there are, again, I want to be very, very clear because the, the anti-opioid campaign has also caused a tremendous amount of harm by uh, preventing people who uh, were relying on opioids uh, from getting them and from physicians tapering people way too quickly and causing a lot of harm. So, so okay, um, but uh, understanding, uh, sort of having clear, uh results showing what well I, you know it's interesting because we do know what works we did not we do know that interdisciplinary pain teams worked uh that uh, that opioids as such on average do not work so i think that the barrier is not so much um with with uh um sort of research when it comes to treatment it's getting that information to clinicians that's one but to also this is not just to again clinicians have their own barriers you know the uh, you know OHIP Ontario Health Insurance plan will reimburse a 10 minute visit you can't counsel a patient in 10 minutes on exercise and opioids an educated patient uh, patient education is a huge huge deal so so the I, I would actually maybe not discount these sort of uh, Canadian uh, pain task force, uh, the, um, and I'm, I'm involved in some of these organizations myself, they are doing a lot. Uh, there is, for instance, a um, an ECHO program, uh, which in Ontario is run uh, among others by Andrea Ferlin, uh, which uh, enables patients and their, their clinicians to bring uh, a particularly uh, uh, tough case to a, a panel of pain experts. So those kinds of things, I would hope that gradually will uh, yield results. Unfortunately, you know, it takes about 10 years for our results to percolate into actual clinical practice. And here it's compounded by absence of education in medical schools and difficulties with reimbursement schemes. <clears throat> So all of those things probably need to sort of grab. So maybe we'll, what we'll take is just, you know, um, the, the, you know, people in Vancouver health, the really high get, getting chronic pain and, and, you know, looking around and saying, wow, you know, we really don't have 
you know, we really need to reimburse it differently. We did have those pain clinics. It is possible to have them for both Canada and the US. Uh, uh, it, it should happen. Sorry, I don't have a better, uh, better answer, which I uh, yeah. No, thank you. We do have another question from the Zoom chat. Uh, Sylvia, if you want to unmute. Uh, hey there, thank you for thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, most of what you talked about today was sort of thinking about the sort of the predictors of who experiences pain, right? And, and different kinds of pain to some extent. And I'm wondering about more thinking about um, how the extent to which people are able to continue to, you know, function in a less disabling way and be socially included when they have pain and the variability in those pathways. And, and I say this as someone who has had chronic pain for over 20 years and has been, you know, more or less able to manage it. Um, it certainly does affect my, you know, my ability to do my job, but I, at times, but I have a lot of flexibility and you know, ability to sort of manage that pain in ways that helps. Um, certainly now I will say being more remote has helped a lot because I don't have to, you know, sit for extended periods of time in rooms, I can move around and so forth. Um, but that's obviously, you know, very tied to class and all kinds of things. And so I'm just thinking about, you know, the research on the other side of it, which I think is also really important when we think about those broader social implications, right? Like who, for whom is pain disabling? and most disabling, right? And for whom, you know, like me, I have suffered with it for 20 years, but you know, I continue to get out there and I ski and I rock climb and I more or less am able to live my life with, you know, with adjustments. So how do we, how do we, how do we look at that part and to what extent are people looking at that side of the equation as well? That, that's a great question. Again, I'll try to paraphrase for, for the room and just give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. And so basically, uh, uh, if you, assuming you have pain, what influences your functioning and, and what factors are involved in that? Is that, okay. So there actually, there, there, is, there is some research. Now, um, not, from, not from our world, because again, we're just starting, right? It's like the world does not exist. You guys need to you know, join it and build it. So uh, we don't know a whole lot, but there actually is a decent amount within the clinical literature, because say, you know, within the, the nursing uh, literature, psychological literature, uh, to small degree econ, but very little, um, uh, on, uh, on how people manage pain. In part, this is because over the past couple of decades, uh, the efforts in the pain biomedical world have changed from uh, eliminating pain to managing pain. Not that patient like it or not that it's a good thing, but that's what happened. And so there has been a lot of research uh, on trying to understand exactly what you're saying. And we do know when I mentioned, for instance, um, uh, social support is very powerful link to managing uh, one's pain effectively. Um, the other thing is, uh, for instance, there's a lot of psychological research on the individual characteristics that um, so for instance pain catastrophizing is a, is a big uh, topic within the psychological literature on pain um, so when when people uh, are uh, react to their pain by sort of this vicious loop of catastrophizing decreasing movement or sort of sort of shrinking their lives if you will and and, and those we know are again more uh, likely to be linked at lower SCS in part because again what combats it is pain education and so 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 we do know a little bit uh, and it's very clear that high SCS uh, is linked to better managing of chronic pain. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing this not because that's not an important thing but but I also want to acknowledge that people with chronic pain you know, managing is good, but not having the chronic pain is better. So, so I, I am taking this literature and sort of uh, understanding that it's so it's to some degree, uh, um, you know, a literature that admitted defeat. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is that a hand? Uh, yeah, just sorry. Can I just have a very quick follow up? Sure. Um, is is there anything around there? I mean, thinking about social support that also ties to interactions with the healthcare system 
And as you say, you know, it can be a sort of disqualifying condition for people, right? And the extent to which, you know, people take your pain seriously, believe you, see you as, you know, seeking opioids or something like that. You know, people, people are treated very differently by by the system, right? And we know that, you know, racism, <laughs> classism, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of things really shape that. Is that part of the picture as well for this research? Yes. And uh, so, so the question, if, if I may, is uh, how do social factors influence the interaction or the, the navigation of a patient within a uh, healthcare system? Is that fair enough? Um, Yes, but also looking at it without further step in terms of their the extent to which then they are able to manage their pain, right? Like, then, do we how, okay. right? Like, do we do we do we ever make take that final step, right? So that we see that the kinds of interactions that people have and the ways in which they're treated with the system actually have implications for their their functioning with with the pain. That's a very good question. So um, I would I'm not aware of any sort of specific uh, you know. Articles or, or or literature, but that's just my not my lack of awareness. I'm not saying there isn't. I'm just saying I'm not aware of it. Um, but I'm thinking again, going back to uh, the uh, interdisciplinary pain clinics, where again they they do not eliminate pain. They provide the tools for the patient to have sort of a richer toolbox that they could then use to manage their own pain. Right? Uh, something that uh, you know. People in 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 uh, high SCS, highly educated, uh, flexible jobs might have. So we know that, it, and and those toolboxes then were linked to uh, a lower pain and better managing. So we there there is a quite a bit of literature on on uh, this. And actually, John Bonica is probably the one name B O N I C A who was a. Um, uh, probably the major force behind interdisciplinary pain clinics and and so he, he will be connected his name will be connected to a lot of this research out of again our world you know there's we've, we've only started scratching the surface um so so i'm not aware of it but uh, but i have no doubt that a uh, um efficient or a good education and and providing a patient with tools uh, both within the medical encounter and sort of outside uh, is absolutely critical. Um, the other person maybe I would, I would suggest is um, Andrea Furlan, who's a pain clinician at U of T, uh, who actually has a really cool YouTube channel uh, doing pain education uh, for patients. And um, she doesn't discuss this in detail, but, but touches on it uh, here and there. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, here yeah. word. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. But, uh, yeah. So we can. Yeah. You can take that last question. Last question. I was wondering uh, how has the pandemic affected all these future? Uh, I'm sorry. How is the pandemic? Mm -hmm. because, uh, because we know that we have a chronic pain crisis. We have an opioid addiction crisis. We have a mental health crisis. We have suicide crisis in many uh, communities. I wonder how this has been affected I and mean, if things could get worse. I think that was good words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. no, that's, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. So again, my two second answer, we don't know. Little longer answer is, you know, the data are in uh, in terms of something like opioids. Uh, we have seen a decrease of opioid use uh, in 2020 and 2021 relative to 2019, but there has been a gradual decrease. So whether that's there's something with opioid specific disruption of medical care or whether it's a long term change in the guidelines, we don't know. Uh, in terms of pain, again, we have the data. I started looking at it, but I don't I, like I literally never looked at the prevalence comparison. So the data is out there. Uh, there should be uh, pretty quickly the, some results. The one difficulty is that we have, um, uh, sorry, you guys need to go, so I'm happy to, to give you a second afterwards. Uh, but basically, surveys had to switch on to a different mode of administration because of COVID. Mm -hmm. It's not quite clear. We need to come back out of COVID, go back to where the surveys were, and then compare. So unfortunately, COVID was, well, if in, in, even in the data collection. 
Uh, we've got one question from Barbara. Oh, we, yeah. Yeah. we were way yeah. past. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I wanted everybody to know that we were keeping continuing this conversation upstairs in the Lionel Lounge. There will be a lunch cater, so please join us up there if you are if you have the time. But thank you so much. Thank you.